get this so you get to know who I am. I love punk rock music. That's actually called ska punk music. I love punk music. I, I tell you, when we talk about reclaiming, I tell you, I've got, I've got friends that I know that, that Jesus is working on, and, and I can't wait for the day that they come to know Jesus, and, and they're going to go, wait, this all happened at a punk show? I'm going to go, yes, that's exactly how it happened, because I go and hang out with them, and I love them, and I, I can reclaim the people there and love them. I can ignore the, the crazy stuff that goes on, but yes, mustard plug. And if you're wondering what in the world a mustard plug is, just imagine if you've got a bottle of mustard and that dried piece on the top that when you open it up, that is a mustard plug. They decided to name their band after that. You can decide if they're good or not after that whole thing. But I am so glad to be here, Christ Church. Fountain Hills, I am from Surprise, which is way over yonder. I don't ever want to do this drive in traffic. Sunday morning was super easy. It was good. I'm going to, I'm going to show my daughters the, the fountain. I haven't been out here for years, but we're going to go check that out afterwards. And they're actually volunteering in the, uh, in the nursery right now because that, that's what they do. They're just servants at heart. So they're there serving. They didn't want to hear me preach twice. I'm going to actually just be real with you. They didn't want to hear me preach once. They, they sort of realized that we were driving past Portillo's on the way here, and they were like, Dad, we're going to get hot dogs, right? Like, it made it all good. So this is a picture of my family. It's at Splash Mountain. We were, we were there in, in September. I'm in the front. My son, who's 17, so enthusiastically behind me. Uh, he is just a ball of energy. Right behind him is his girlfriend. That's Maddie. And then the next one is Grace. And then there is Kayla with the crazy face. And all the way in the back, because she is way smarter than I, is my wife, Andrea. She knew when they put the 250-pound dude in the front of Splash Mountain, it was going to be just that. And I was drenched, and she was in the back going, I had no problem. You were digging into the water, and I was out of the water, and I never got wet. So that is my family. I wanted to let you know who they are so you're kind of seeing who I am. I have been on staff out in Surprise for about four years now. I'm also a high school guidance counselor. I'm a crazy bivocational guy. So last two years, I've been leading uh, the church out there and working uh, at five days a week at Ironwood High School as a high school guidance counselor. I've been in education for 18 years. Um, God has called me to ministry, and I love it, and it's wonderful. And someday I pray that he'll call me out of the public school section, but he has not done that yet. So I'm going to be faithful and I'm going to stay and I love working with my high school kids. And uh, so I get to do both. I'm going to tell you this screen, just, just give you a little insight. I think Trent paid somebody because he was like, man, that screen's going to be done. You're going to get to use it first. Like, that's not fair. You come all the way over here, and, and then it's not done. I don't know. I think he's waiting for it, but uh, it, it is good. One last thing before we get started. Got to tell you how important my family is. There, there's something that happens on important days, and I believe this is an important day. This is actually the first time that I've ever gotten to teach a, at a church outside of my little surprise home. And... In 1967, my dad was a senior in high school, and he found out the day of graduation that he was graduating. And like any normal, you can decide how good of a student he was if he found out that day. But like any normal high school senior to celebrate, he decided to go to Woolworth and buy orange socks to wear at graduation. So he wore these orange socks at his high school graduation, and they're wonderful. They're polyester, and... And so then he decided, if I wore them there, I'm going to wear them when I get married. So he wore orange socks when, when he married my mom. He, he wore them when he graduated from NAU. He wore them for 30 years on the first day of school as a teacher. When I was born, when my brother was born, when my brother got married, when I started teaching, he wore one sock and I wore the other sock. So I figure it's a big day. So check them out. Yes. These are the original polyester 1967 socks. There's a little bit of a hole in one of them. I just try to ignore it, but I'm kind of a sock guy, and I can feel my toe moving, and it freaks me out. They're sweaty. I can't wait. I brought a change of socks in the car, so I don't have to wear them later. But I am so glad to be here with you today, and, 
and just get to, to see the other side of the family. I'll tell you, we love partnering with you over in Surprise. Things have been going great. It has been a wonderful two weeks that we have had of working as a team to, to put together the sermons. Trent threw me a tough one last weekend, but it was fun and we had a good time. And then Keith is actually in Surprise this weekend teaching there and uh, People are really excited for that, so it's going to be great. We have seen a, a pretty significant boost in our attendance uh, in the last few weeks, and, and it is great. We cannot wait just to continue to get to know you guys and, and spend more and more time with you. We've got some, some great things planned. Would you stand with me as we uh, go through this teaching of Christ together? We're focused on Matthew 12, verses 1 through 8. It says, About the time Jesus was walking through some grain fields on the Sabbath, his disciples were hungry, so they began breaking off some heads of grain and eating them. But some Pharisees saw them do it and protested, Look, your disciples are breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath. Jesus said to them, Haven't you read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God, and he and his companions broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. And haven't you read in the law of Moses that the priests on duty in the temple may work on the Sabbath? I tell you, there is one here who is even greater than the temple. But you would not have condemned my innocent disciples if you knew the meaning of the scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For the Son of Man is Lord, even over the Sabbath. Pray with me. Heavenly Father God, as we just learn from you today, Lord, I ask you to open our hearts. Allow your mercy to flow through us that we can reach this world, that we can reach out to people that are far from you, that do not know who you are, that our love, uh, the, the love that you have for us just spreads through our lives and into theirs. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for our gathering. Lord, be with each and every person who gathers in your name today, that your glory will shine through, that your name will be known, and you will change this earth forever. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Can you imagine walking through the fields? I don't know about you. I kind of am dorky. I like mu musicals, and I just, like, get this disciples walking through, and it's a little, like, sound of music, like, the hills are alive. I don't think they were singing, but I think they were cruising through. They had to have their arms out, feeling the grain. And there's no reason why the Pharisees are walking behind them except for to be stalking them, sneaking behind them. They, they have no interest in what is going on right now, except for to look at these guys and find them doing something wrong. And as soon as they see them doing something wrong, they bring it up. Excuse me, excuse me, Mr. Jesus, look, your disciples, they're harvesting on the Sabbath. But let's be real for a second. Are, are they really harvesting are they, are they working that hard? No, they're walking through and they're breaking off little tops of, of the grain and they're eating them. They're hungry. They're, they're hungry. That, that's it. See, the, the, the Pharisees are only focused on the rules and the regulations, the do's and the don'ts, the cans and the cannots. It's the letter of the law for them. And they felt like they had something that they needed to confront Jesus and his followers on. But see, Jesus, and I'm so thankful for Jesus, because he shows us how important people are. That the lives around us are more important than being slaves to tradition. That the individual is more important than the tradition. See, when we talk about the Pharisees, there, there's some, it's so easy for us to just be like, man, they're bad. Do you see what they do? How, how, how mean they are and how they're just trying to continually yell at people and, and tell them what they can and can't do. But have you ever noticed that we can become accidental Pharisees? You know, we don't intend to at all, but all of a sudden we, we shift from the relationship to Jesus to just throwing out the cans and the cannots. The, the, you can't do this, you can't do that. And, and, and we just get upset with people. We focus on the rules Instead of the idea and the fact that Jesus is the Lord and Savior. See, it's the difference between religion and relationship. When religion, when it's religious and not relational, our heart becomes harder. Our heart becomes harder. And, and like stones, it, it, our heart 
will, will, will become more and more hard. And, and guys, if you're anything like me, right, whenever you see rocks and there's an open area, we just like to throw them. Right? I mean, like, if there's a lake, we're throwing them. If, if there's a large span, we're going to just pick up some rocks and just see how far we can throw it. Because when we have stones in our life, we want to throw them. And like stones, stones are thrown and easily hurt, thrown at people to hurt them. Jesus says that, you know, we find the smallest things to point out. Jesus says it's so easy to find that speck of dust in someone's eye, but we miss the log sticking out of our own, Right? Have you noticed in your life how easy it is to focus on the negative? Ladies, I'll call you out. Your husband, you know, does something really nice, you know, makes dinner for you. And, and you've had a long day at work and, and he's made dinner for you. And, and, and you don't see that he made dinner. You see that he made a mess in the kitchen. And you completely miss that he did something caring for you. And you're like, but there's dishes. It's so easy to focus on the negative. My, se- my son is a 17-year-old senior in high school. He's actually in Manhattan, Kansas right now. Also, with, with boy, he's a lucky guy. He's with his mom and his two grandmas. They're all together. <laughs> he's like, yes, this is how I want to visit college. But he's out there. <laughs> he's out there for a scholarship weekend. You can be praying on that for me. He's in his second interview in about 10 minutes. For, for a great scholarship at Manhattan Christian College. And my, my salary as a public school teacher hasn't done so great on the uh, saving for college fund. So uh, we're really hoping for this scholarship. But I'll tell you, this 17-year-old boy, he's an amazing kid. He's a hard worker. He's funny. He works at QT. He's played basketball his whole high school career. He's a good leader. But he's 17 years old. Raise your hand if you've ever had a 17-year-old. Anyone? Anyone? Okay, cool. After service, I'm going to talk to you because I don't know what to do. Holy cow. 17. See, when I focus on the rules, I could just be nailing this kid constantly. When I am stuck on the rules, it he seems completely confused right now. Like, I, I, I tell him to do something, and he looks at me like, have I ever done that before? Wait, what? What are you asking me? And I, I'm concerned about his hearing because I'll tell him to do something, and, and he says he can't hear me. And, and then I, I'll, like, I'll ask him to do the dishes, and he'll do them, and then I'll look at the pots and pans, and it's like, did you really? Did this touch water? What is happening? You know, we go into the bathroom after he cleaned it, and it's wiped down, Dad. I don't know. And and it's just crazy. And if I focus on the rules, on the what I've told him to do, man, I could beat him up all day long. I could just be constantly just telling him, well, you didn't do this right, and you didn't do this right, and you didn't do this right. But when I start focusing on the relationship, when I start looking at who my son is and really thinking about the situation where he's at, see, I see it. See, it's, it's our first kid sending off to college, so our stress level's a little high at our house right now. I don't know why. My wife's already planning a graduation party. I figure it'll happen down the road. We don't need to worry about that. But there's a stress level that's pretty high. And then I realize I've already gone to school. When I, left, when I went to school, I just went to NAU a couple hours away. He's going to Kansas. He's going to become a pastor. He's doing all these crazy things that we never thought would happen in our family And when I focus on the relationship, I see all the uncertainty, all the stress that he's carrying. And it makes me not want to beat him up so much and just just mess with him about not being able to do do the right thing. It makes me want to walk shoulder to shoulder with him with my arm around him going, hey, you know what? We'll get through this together because I promise you, if you talk to your Nana and Pop, I was an idiot when I was 17 too. Maybe when I was 22 also, I don't know, but... You know, it makes me want to walk with him. It makes me want to do life with him. I want to draw him close to me. See, when we get caught up looking constantly at the bad in people or, or, or the negative situations around us, it keeps our eyes off the truth. And the truth is, is Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And when we focus on him, we see love and we see mercy. We're moved to include, not to exclude. We're moved to walk along with people. Our arms should open wider. We should be even more welcoming. 
Without him, we find ourselves picking out the little things. I'd like to show you a video. The teacher wrote one math problem wrong, and then the next nine right, and everybody only focused on the one wrong problem. Have you seen that in the world? The person who makes one mistake, it might have been a big mistake, but do we ever forgive them? Does the world move past it, or do you just focus and label that person as, that's the guy who did that? See, I just thank God that when we meet Jesus, our wrongs are forgiven. They're erased. But do we have that same focus when it comes to other people? Do we see that they may be making a choice that we know that God would, wouldn't approve of, but we can still come alongside them. We can still reach out to them. We are wired to see the negative things in life. Biologically, we respond to the negative things. It triggers our fight or flight mechanism in our body, and we respond to them. Years back, I was an elementary guidance counselor, and I had a group of seventh graders that were, well, horrible. That's just the way you describe them. And the teachers were really struggling. And the only thing they had was a card that they could write down the negative behaviors. And if there were a certain amount of negatives on the card, the kids would get a detention or a call home. And the behavior was not getting any better. The kids were f flowing into detention. It was a frustrating time for these teachers. And I stopped them and I said, here's the deal. When the only thing you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. When the only thing you have is a negative consequence, you did this wrong, everything looks like a nail and I'm just going to hit you with it. And I said, what if we did this? What are some things you want to see? What do you want to see these seventh graders do? And they came up with a list of good behaviors, you know, like lining up quietly, walking into the room and getting started on their bell work, uh, doing their homework, um, you know, all these different things. They came up with this huge list. I said, how about we do this? Let's add another side to the card. Let's try to notice twice as many positive things that these kids are doing than negative things. Every time they do something good, let's encourage them about it. Let's, let's encourage them to do that. So we got these cards ready. I said, in two weeks, we're going to meet again. Let's, let's see how this goes. Two weeks later, I meet with the teachers. There were no positives written down. None. None. And I was like, wait, what, what, what's going on? Like, these kids did nothing right? And, and I'm like, did they line up for class? Well, yeah, they're supposed to do that. They're supposed to do that. Yeah, we were going to encourage them to do that. Did, did, they, did they work on their bell work when they came into the classroom? Well, yeah, but that's the expectation. They're supposed to do that. Yeah, I know. We want them to do it, so we're going to encourage them to do it. And they were like, but that's just what they're supposed to do. And I'm thinking, oh, man, i got to rethink this because this is all negative. That's the only thing they're focusing on is the negative. And I said, okay, here's the deal, you guys. This is what I want you to do. The next two weeks, I want you to build a relationship with these kids. I want you to start talking to them, find out what they do after school, who they are, what they love, what they dislike, all those things. Two weeks later, guess what? There were more positive things that happened. You want to know why? Because they were going, hey, I met this kid. I really talked to this kid. And did you know that his dad does, isn't even home at night? And his mom leaves for work at 4 o'clock in the morning. And, and he gets himself ready all by himself. And so no wonder he needs a little attention in the morning. So I just started talking to him. And, and then he's now telling the joke in class and, 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 and just being able to, to, to get some attention at the beginning of the day. And, and they're telling me all these stories because it's the relationship is the key to showing mercy. They were building a relationship with these, with these kids, and it was easier to see them beyond their faults, beyond the things that they did, and said, hey, you know what? These are kids. Let's encourage them. Let's grow. They might have made mistakes, but we can do this. And see, relationship is the key to showing mercy. And unfortunately, in this teaching, and in this time where Jesus is, the Pharisees had lost their focus on relationship. They had forgotten the God who walked with their people through so many mistakes and so many missteps and just said, don't worry, I'll bring you back. You may have a consequence, but I'll bring you back. I'll keep bringing you along. And they would stopped and they focused on what we should and shouldn't do. They had turned into religious robots. Their lives were memorized religious routines. They offered sacrifices and acted out of guilt or obligation. 
and they lacked a relationship. They could see nothing outside of their correct behavior and, and had no patience for people who did not display that same behavior. But see, when you know Jesus, it's not about what you can and cannot do. It's about what he has done for us. And as we get to know him, we will be compelled to reach out further, to go into the darkest places of the world, reclaiming it, shining his light. We'll be able to love more fully. His mercy will flow through us. I love the idea that we're, two, we're one church in two places. Today I want to go over our mission for 2018. And I think it's great because I don't know most of you. And, and over in Surprise, Keith is, is teaching to a group of people that he doesn't know very well and saying that we are united in this. This is how we are going to move as a church. And our mission is one real passion. It's shown like this on our website. Each one matters. Be real and follow the passion of Jesus. As I share today, I want to break down our mission, our, our mission and show you how it lines up with showing mercy. The first part is each one matters. This means the church and the unchurched, the people who have accepted God's forgiveness and those who have not yet. Everyone matters. The people who sin just like us, the people who sin differently than us, they matter. As we grow in our relationship with Jesus, the people furthest away from him should matter to us because he died for them also. Is your focus that wide? Is your focus that wide? Can you walk in to the darkest places and know that God loves these people, though you may feel like you have nothing in common with them? Can you share his love through your actions with them? Or are you fitting it into a narrow part that says, you know what, if I invited them to church, they'd fit in. Our grasp needs to be that wide. Colossians 2, 16 through 19. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for, for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. For these rules are only shadows of the realities yet to come. And Christ himself is that reality. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or worship of angels, saying they have had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud, and they are not connected to Christ, the head of the body. For he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments, and it grows as God nourishes it. See, we cannot go around condemning people for what they, they do or don't celebrate. It says, the people that are doing that are not connected to Christ. We need to be connected with Jesus. We can't condemn people for what they're doing. We are to live in a way that shows God's love to people. Will there be a point where you'll have to speak the truth? Absolutely. But the permission to speak that truth is not because you've been forgiven and it's now time to yell at everybody else. The permission is given through a relationship. When those people know how much you care about them, how much you love them, how much you've walked through life together, then you have the permission to speak truth into their lives. It's this balance of grace and truth, grace and truth. And some of us, we balance on truth. No, it's truth all the time. we got to tell you the truth. Or some of us balance on grace. Oh, it's okay that you do that. It's all right. No, it's a balance. It's grace and truth. There's forgiveness. There's truth. There's standards. There's truth. There's grace. And we're going to balance those things. If you go back to the teaching of Jesus today, the disciples were hungry. They mattered. They mattered. Jesus wanted the need met. He didn't go, oh, guys, hey, there's somebody who might be watching us, and they might think you're harvesting on the Sabbath, and they might get mad at us, so you better not eat that. No, they mattered. That need mattered. It, it, it wasn't a big deal to him. David and his men were hungry, and they ate the sacred bread. They mattered. The person in their need mattered more. One of my favorite actions of Jesus is found in Mark 1, verse 40 and 42. It simply says, a man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus begging to be healed. 
If you're willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. I love this. Moved with compassion. Jesus just moved with the love that he has for this man. Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said. Be healed. Instantly, the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. Why do I love this? Because this man should have been kept away from everybody. This man should have been out of the city gates. He shouldn't have been anywhere near touching people because of his disease. But he mattered to Jesus. Even more incredible, Jesus didn't need to touch him. Look at all the times that Jesus had healed him. He did it in all sorts of ways. He said, you've been healed. He spit in mud and he made mud and rubbed things. And he did all sorts. Of, he didn't have to touch this guy. But I think he touched him because he knew that the man needed it. The man needed that. After suffering from this disease, after being an outcast, he needed someone to reach out and touch him. Jesus had no fear of getting the disease. He cures these diseases. But he needed contact, someone to show him value. Family, who do you know? that needs to be touched? Who do you know that need, you need someone to walk in with the compassion of Jesus and spend time with them in their lives, get to know them, get to know their difficulties? See, this is where it gets difficult, right? It, 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 it's difficult to love people that are right around us in the same situation, making completely different choices. The last few years, we've done a lot of work in Haiti on the surprise side. And, and, and we help support kids and, and everything. And I don't know about you, but do you ever find it easier to love people like in a foreign country that is a completely different situation? You know, it, their lives look so different than ours. It's like, oh, man, they just need help. They need help. But then we look at our neighbors, and they have the same type of house. They have the same type of job but they're making decisions and their attitudes are so different than ours, they almost meet our scorn. It's like, well, why? Why are they doing that? I can't believe they do that. And, and it's easier to love people that are different than us. You know, it's sad. I talk a lot about people that sin differently than us. Because you've run into those times where you're like, oh, sweet, they're a gossip, so am I. We're good. I'm comfortable with that sin, right? I'm okay. I, I do that. But when people sin differently, you're like, oh, man, that's different. Like, I don't get drunk, and he does. Like, he's bad. But if it's the same as me, like, oh, I'm, I'm okay with that because I've lived with that. You know, and, and so we have to be comfortable reaching out to people that sin differently than us, that have different beliefs in us, that are making different decisions than us. Everyone needs to know the strength, the love, and grace of Jesus. Each one matters. Isaiah 66 6 says, I want you to show love, not offer sacrifice. I want you to know me more than I want burnt offerings. God is calling and saying, I want you to show love more than I want you to give me a sacrifice. I want you to know who I am. Be intimately involved with me. I want to know about your life more than I want a burnt offering. He wants relationships between us and out around us. Can we be honest for a second, though? When you think about this, anybody get scared? Anybody get a little nervous? Like, oh, man, I don't know if I can do that. Like, do I have to talk to those people? Or, oh, even if it's just my neighbor. Can I tell you this? I want you to take heart because it takes faith to reach out. And it says that Jesus perfects our faith, right? So as we continue to, to, to come and to gather as a family, to, to be in the word and to soak through the word and, and really look at the things that, that Jesus is teaching us, we grow closer and closer. He's going to change our heart and make it easier to reach out to other people. You will be more and more comfortable, but start today. Start with the easy ones. This is how we want to live our lives. Romans 14, 7, 8. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. If we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Each one matters. Second part in our statement is be real. Family, you are important. And I want you to grasp that fact. 
You are important. And you're important because of this. Every struggle, every victory can be used for the glory of God. Everything that you've gone through, those things that you think, no, I don't want to tell anybody about, that, that year that you, that 20 years, whatever it was, that you were steeped in sin and God has forgiven you, you need to use that to reach someone else. You are important. See, the people in Surprise, I think they might kind of be glad that I'm here today and Keith's out there because they might be kind of tired of hearing the things that I struggle with. Because I'm going to tell you, as you get to know me, I will tell you what I struggle with. And here is why. I want you to know that even though I have not overcome all things that happen in my life, man, I know that Jesus is doing a great work inside of me. And I am so much further along. And I, God has changed me so much from the day that, that, I, that I was found That things have changed so much. I'm going to tell people where I came, what I overcame. This is who I was. This is where I want to go. And this is where I'm at right now. And I want to be honest about it. See, right now, I mean, think about it. The, The word, if you talk to someone who doesn't come to church, doesn't know Jesus, if you say, what do you think of Christians? The first word is hypocrite. Oh, they're hypocrites. And unfortunately, we might fit into that. We might fit that label because we try to hide our sins. We try to hide our shortcomings. But have you noticed we're not good at it at all? We're awful at it. Like, oh, no, that's not going to actually happen. And then people are smart enough, they see through it, and we do look hypocritical. We do. Jesus says this in Matthew 23, 25 through 26 in the message. You're hopeless, you religion, religion scholars and Pharisees, frauds. You burnish the surface of your cup and bowls so they sparkle in the sun while the insides are maggoty with your greed and gluttony. Stupid Pharisees, scour the inside and then the gleaming surface will mean something. See, being real is not celebrating sin. It's not celebrating, hey, look at how sinful I am. No, it's not that. It's a sincere desire to know Jesus and to do what he calls us to do. It's an invitation to the world that says, I am not, but I know I am. It's an invitation that invites all people and says, hey, come and do life with me as I cling to this cross. Let's cling to this cross together. Let's know that we don't have it perfect. And you and I, we could do life together all while depending on Jesus. That is how we are real. We all need to be real because Each of us have people in our lives that need to know Jesus. And they need to see our struggles and our forgiveness and our victories. You can't leave it to the pastors. You can't leave it to staff members. I talk all the time to to the people in Surprise and say, Hey, look, I'm never going to meet all your families. I'm never going to meet all your coworkers. You need to represent Jesus as much as I do. But sometimes they're better at it than I am. It's amazing how that works. John 2 Oh, next one, sorry. Third thing is to follow the passion of Jesus. In John chapter 2, we see Jesus walking into the temple. And he's so frustrated with the way that the people are treating his father's house. He takes rope and he makes a whip out of it. And he whips and clears the temple of everything. He kicks some butt. He is so frustrated clearing the people out. And in verse 17, he says this. Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from Scripture. Passion for God's house will consume me. His passion for the Father first. His passion is for the Father first and doing his will. And then it's for his people. See, if we're to follow his passion, we must strive to live for an audience of one. Following his will while reaching out to the people around us. Mark 12, verse 30 and 31. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. The second one is equally, equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. And I really wish Jesus would have stopped at this, the first one, right? Man, it's so much easier to love God. It's so much easier to love God. And then he throws in the love your neighbor. Love people around you. So many of us, we got, you know, if I'm being real, I, I'm so much better at loving God 
And then there's these people that drive me crazy. And it's like, oh, yeah, i got to remember, I love them too. I love them too. Let's, let's reach out to them. I love when Trent says, don't call me a Christian. I'm a fully, uh, fully devoted follower of Jesus. I think when it, when it gets scary to say, I'm going to love God with all my heart, and I'm going to love my neighbors as myself, and, and God's calling me to follow his will first, live for an audience of one, and then reach out to other people, I know that as I devote myself to following Jesus completely, it's possible to do this through his power, through his example. If you think about it, think about who Jesus loved as he followed the will of his father and as he reached out to people around him. Think of who he loved who had completely different beliefs or different actions than he did. Zacchaeus, Matthew, there's Roman centurions, the adulterous woman in John 8, Nicodemus, the disciples themselves. He was following the will you know, following the will of his father and reaching out and loving the people around him. And his passion for the father and for the people changed their lives forever. And our passion for the father and for people can change their lives as they see and experience the love and grace of Jesus. So as we move forward, I want you to think about this. What do you pray for? As we look, one real passion, what do you pray for? I know in my own life, I pray for the things that, that are so near and dear to me. You know, my, my prayer life is, is filled with my family, with, with my kids, with things that God has shown me that they break my heart. I pray for teenagers. I, I, I spend five days a week with 2,000 teenagers. I pray for teenagers and the struggles they go through, things that break my heart, things that are so important to me, I pray about them. The things that are closest to my heart are constantly in my prayer. The lost are constantly in my prayer. And I think the same thing is, is, is correct with you. It's the same, you guys have the same types of prayers, those things that you absolutely love. And so I think it's probably the same, the tr same thing is true when we look at Jesus' prayer. When we look at what Jesus prays about, it's those things that are near and dear to his heart. In Jesus' love for the Father and us, he prays like this in John 17, verse 20 and 23. I'm praying not only for these disciples, but all of us who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in you, in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, so they may be, be one as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world would know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. See, Trent has asked us to pray this continually as we move forward with two campuses, as we seek the unforgiven in Fountain Hills and the unforgiven in Surprise, the people who do not yet know Jesus, all the people that we come in contact with, see that we will be united. We will be united. We will be together and we will reach out and love people. Our main why at Christ Church is for us to reach the unforgiven. And when doing this, we can't get caught up in, in the regulations, the sacrifices, and forget mercy and love. I want you to remember this motto. It's the motto of the Restoration Church. It says, in essentials, there's unity. In non-essentials, there's liberty. And in all things, love. The essentials are who God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are, what the Bible and communion and baptism are. In these, we have unity. It, starting point today, you'll, you'll hear exactly how we stand united between, behind those six things. In those, we have unity. But in non-essentials, there's liberty. That's things like, how are we going to celebrate Halloween? Is there going to be speaking in tongues or not speaking in tongues? Those are things that are just going to divide us. And they're not important. They're not salvation issues. They're not important enough to argue about. And in all things, we will lead with love. 
In all things we will lead in love. In every discussion we ever have about faith, we will lead in love. In all instances where we are talking to people, we will lead in love. If you disagree, lead in love. That is how we will make a difference for Jesus in this world. As the worship team comes up and leads us, we're going to move into a time of communion. And as we take communion, I want you to focus. I want you to focus not on the routine of it, but I want you to think. As we, as we take communion, we're remembering what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's a time where we are just thankful and rejoice in the forgiveness. And there's forgiveness there. And on top of that, there's a restoration of relationship that we can freely come to the Father. If we just take that and know that God's mercy has been laid upon us, His grace has been laid upon us, and then when we leave this building, we can't forget that, that we are the church. When we're in Fountain Hills, wherever we go, we are the church, we're representing Jesus. Let's lead with love. Let's see what happens when we lead with love when we try to build relationships with people, there'll be a time for truth. God's truth is so important, but it's equally balanced with His grace. Pray with me. Heavenly Father God, I thank you today that we could come and just rejoice in the freedom that we have in this life. Lord, I thank you for setting us free from our sins, for breaking the chains. This truly is a glorious day. God, as we move forward in 2018, Lord, as whatever you have in store for Christ's church, God, help us to lead with love. Help us to show mercy. Help us to live in relationship with you. And that our relationship with you and doing your will is our number one thing in our lives, Lord. Fill us with your spirit that will just go out and love people. We do your will, we love people. Just constantly, together. Help us to become natural at it. Perfect our faith. Allow us to reach out into the darkest places of the world. God, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your death on the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection, the freedom.